right, thanks for coming to hear me talk about um, hybridization in Joshua trees. So we know that interactions between species can contribute to the process of diversification all along the spectrum from local adaptation to full reproductive isolation. So I've got Ragolitis, Stivalax, and Heliconius as examples of species that have different kinds of other specific interactions that are contributing. So what I'm interested in, the work I'm talking about today, is understanding when and how those interactions between species are most likely to contribute to divergence and the maintenance of divergence. The organisms I'm talking about today are Joshua trees. So you're probably familiar with this Joshua tree here on the left. It's got a long trunk, a tall branching form. But there's actually also another species of Joshua tree it's down the right. So the classic Joshua tree, Yacobarbifolia, and this other species, the Yacobarbifoliana. And while these Seussian growth forms are very cool, there's something about these trees that I think is even, is even cooler, and that's the pollination system. So these are yuccas, and so like most yuccas, they're pollinated by yacamas in a mutually obligate relationship. So these yacamas will, the females will collect pollen from the flowers, stuff it under their, their chin, their neck, so you can see this yellow ball in the middle of the picture, that's this, this female has pollen there. And they'll travel to another flower, scrape the pollen out with a leg, and then stuff it into the stigma, um, purposefully pollinating. So that's what we see happening in this picture. And although the growth forms are very dramatically differentiated between the trees, the trait that's the most significantly and consistently differentiated between species is actually a trait we think is key to this interaction. And that's the length of the styles. So these gray objects in the middle of the slide are the female reproductive organs of Joshua trees, but the pistils, so Verbifolia on the left and Jagariana on the right. The style length is the different, the distance between the stigma at the top where the pollen is deposited and where the ovules begin, which is indicated by the horizontal black dotted line. Um, so the yucca moths that pollinate these Joshua trees are different. They each have each species of tree has its own species um, of yucca moth. So we have Tigeticula synthetica on the left and Anathetica on the right. And what you can see pretty clearly in this picture is that there's a strong correlation between the body size and the moth and the style length in the tree that it pollinates. And this is a pattern of tree matching that's, that's typical of co-evolution. Uh, this pattern is found not just comparing across species, but within species as well. So each of the dots in this graph is a single population. We've got Verbifolia in green triangles on the left, and uh, Jagarion Jager on the left, Verbifolia on the right. So that you can see even within species, there's variation across populations, but a maintenance of this correlation between traits. And what this suggests to us is that a mismatch in moth body size, or the positive length, which is strongly correlated, and between the style length that the tree is pollinating, is resulting in reduced fitness for one or both partners in this mutualism. Now the moth pollinators are completely reproductively isolated, but the Joshua trees are not. And so what we think might be happening here is that disruptive selection of style length could be contributing to divergence in these two Joshua tree species. Across most of the range of the Joshua trees, these two species are allopatric. So you've got Brevifolia in blue on the left of this map, and Jagariana on the right in green. But there is one known zone of hybridization in Joshua trees, the top of the map in southern Nevada, Tikkabu Valley. Um, so let's look at what that hybrid zone looks like genetically. Each vertical line here is structure scores for a single tree in the hybrid zone. And the trees are organized from left to right in um, a transect perpendicular to the hybrid zone. So on the left side, you have populations that are dominated by pure Rubifolia trees, and on the right, Jagariana trees. But in the middle, you can see the high rhizome proper, where you find both pure individuals of both species intermixed with hybrid individuals. We've used this population to take a population genomics approach to understanding whether there's selection on this, this key style of trait. So we developed um, the SNPs using a rat seek approach, about 10,000 informative SNPs. And we performed a GWAS to identify loci that are significantly associated with the variation in styling for the trees. And then we asked whether those SNPs are likely 
to be associated with disruptive selection. And what we found is that seems to be the case. So in allopatry, we find that different alleles are favored in these two species. And in the hybrid zone, we find signs of unusual amounts of, um, of selection against heterozygotes, so disruptive selection. So this sort of sounds like, yeah, maybe this is a really important trait, maintaining differentiation. But then, if you look at other traits that are significantly differentiated between species, you find the same general patterns. Not generally as strong, but they're there. So then the question is, is there really strong disruptive selection around a lot of traits, or is linkage disequilibrium driving those patterns? Um, to try to tease those things apart, we decided to take an explicitly geographic approach. So we went to a geographic crime analysis, and this is a method that was developed by Martin and others in the 80s and the 90s. Um, and it's a way to look at how the frequency of an allele that a SNP they're interested in or the phenotype of interest changes as you go across a hybrid zone. So this x-axis is your position along a transect that's perpendicular to the hybrid zone. And we're asking, how does this gray line change? So the two parameters I'm going to focus on today are the center of the line and the width. So at what point does the line stop being so steep and it moves into the tails? And to understand what we can learn from these parameters, I'm going to go through a few hypothetical climbs first. So here's a hybrid index or genomic average climb, and this is going to be our baseline for comparison. I'll put it in the background of all the slides and dotted line. So let's imagine a locus that's under no selection. It's freely moving across the hybrid zone. We expect to see no climb at all of this straight line. On the other hand, a locus that's un un under unusually strong selection We'd expect to see a climb that looks like this. So it's narrower and steeper than the genomic average. Um, the other pattern that we're looking for is a shift in center. So that would look like this. So on the right, we have the genomic, the genome-wide average center. And on the left, the hypothetical climb for this SNP has shifted 2,000 meters to the west. So that would suggest that either this SNP is adaptively progressing and we've caught it in the process of that, or it's responding to a selective climb, so maybe an ecological shift that's offset from the center of the genome-wide average. So getting back to our Joshua trees, we hypothesize that selection for moss on style length is contributing to the maintenance of divergence in the species. And if these are true, if this is true, what we expect to see is that climbs for style length and the associated SNPs are going to be steeper than the genome-wide average. And we also expect the climbs are going to be coinciding with the agent of selection, and in that case, that's the frequency of, of moth pollinators. So we performed this client analysis using the package HSAR implemented in R, and I'll be comparing clients using the 95% Kresel interval, so non overlapping intervals, significantly different parameters. So first I'll show you that hybrid index client, the reference client, and then I'll show you the pollinator frequency Clients so are putative selective agent. Uh, and then the phenotypic client for the style, and finally I'll show you the SNP clients, both the low side that we found significantly associated with styling, the OG loss, and then the clients for the top 1% most differentiated SNPs between the two species in the reference. Alright, so here's our hybrid index client. Each of the plus marks is an average. For, for a bin of trees along that transect. So there are at least 10 trees represented in each of those plus signs. And what we can see here is that this is a climb that's really quite steep, quite narrow, compared to a lot of other hybrid zones. So this is a fast transition from one species to another. And when we look at our putative agent of selection, the moth frequency, we're seeing a climb that's a really good match. So this is not significantly different in width or in center. Um, the moths are showing a really remarkable matching of the distribution of, of trees. So if moths are exerting strong selection on style length, we would expect a distribution like this to produce a strong climb in style length. And here's what the phenotypic climb looks like. It's not. It's <laughs> so the center is not significantly different, but the width is, is much wider. So it's actually at least twice as wide as a climb. Uh, so this looks like, like maybe strong selection is not happening. But to depending on what the, genome, the genetic architecture of the trait is, there could still be strong selections being masked. 
So let's look at let's look at those snip points. Um, and so, so sometimes the truth is ugly, <laughs> but I'm going to walk you through it, so it's going to be all right. Um, so they're all over the place, and we have three cards that are significantly offset to the west. We have three that are offset to the east, and six of these climbs are significantly shallower than the hybrid index climb. So, so it looks like, really, the this, this story in this hybrid zone is not that selection and styling is the most important thing keeping the species apart. And so to bring this home, I'm going to show you those climbs for the most significantly differentiated SNPs, the highest FST SNPs. Uh, and they're a great match for the genome-wide average. So it's clear that there is strong selection, maintaining this hyperzone. It just doesn't seem to be on style line. So in conclusion, uh, we did find this, this really impressively strong uh, concordance between the distribution of the trees and the distribution of the moths. So what that tells us is that either the pollinators have um, very high fidelity to the host, or uh, they perform poorly on their own host and they're bad dispersers. We have some reasons to think it's the second one. Um, also, we, we don't find evidence for divergent selection maintaining the hybrid zone. So the final conclusion is that in this particular situation, the interspecific interaction does not appear to be currently what's maintaining divergence between these two species. So to be clear, this, this doesn't mean that, that moths have never contributed to divergence. It's possible that in the past they did play a role in the system, we just don't know. So one way that we're working in getting at, at whether that's theoretically possible is using phenotypic selection experiments in the hybrid zone. And that's been ongoing, and we have at least one more year of that using reciprocal transplant studies. It's really exciting. And then finally, we want to get at what's happening with these really steep SNP climbs. Um, so our current hypothesis is that perhaps there's strong post selection in early life stages. So we're working on looking at um, seed production and seed with performance in hybrids. So I'd like to thank our collaborators and our funding sources, and I'd love to hear your questions.